One of the university's premier uh, institutes, one we're really quite proud of, is the American Heritage Center. Uh, this is an archive, and it aims to preserve the records, the documents, and the other primary sources of Wyoming's history. If you've ever visited Laramie, you won't have missed the AHC. Uh, it's the teepee, that symbolic mountain, or as, as uh, uh, I saw in one of Leslie's titles, the cone on the plain, cone on the range, excuse me, the cone on the range. And it stands above, of course, even the arena auditorium. <laughs> so it, it is really quite a prominent thing in Laramie. Uh, our next speaker is, is the American Heritage Center's uh, Leslie Wagner. She's the archivist of the Alan K. Simpson Institute, which works to gather the records of the state's most crotchety politician, Senator Al. Uh, but Leslie does not just keep her head in the clouds with our national public figures. Um, since 2010, she has worked to preserve the voices of American citizens, preserve the voices literally, um, through two large oral history projects. Um, in 2010, she, she had a project to interview people who were involved in and infected by the uh, Sublette County natural gas boom of 2000 to 2008. And in 2011, she began a project on the projected Niobrara oil play, which she videotaped uh, with the help of our, that woman back there behind the camera, uh, uh, Ali Grossman. Uh, she videotaped interviews with those involved and infected uh, by the existing and impending oil developments in the Laramie County, as well as Platte, Goshen, and Converse County. And all of these voices are now preserved along beside Senator Al's at the uh, American Heritage Center at UW. Uh, Leslie Wagner's talk today comes out of these projects and her analysis provides perspective on how Wyoming citizens have reacted to the energy extraction developments. She will speak on the topic, please give us one more boom, oil and gas in Wyoming. Well, I do feel like I'm talking to the choir, or preaching to the choir a bit, talking to an audience in Gillette about energy. And I just want to ask, first of all, how many of you in this audience are involved in the energy industry in some way? I won't even say just oil and gas. So we've got a third of our audience. So I applaud you and, and thank you for working in an industry that means so much to Wyoming, and I might be talking to you later to do an oral history with you, <laughs> um, because one place I haven't been yet is Gillette. Well, I want to talk about the oil and gas industry. You will he hear me talk more about oil, just because it has a, a longer history of commercial use. But when I say the word petroleum, what do you immediately think of as a use for petroleum? Cars? Plastics, good one. That's a good one. Anyone else? What was it? Fertilizer. Wow, you can, I knew I was talking to this educated audience. Well, those are, yes, yes, those are very much uses. Um, one of the early uses was actually medicine. Still is a use for petroleum, but when um, oil seeps, uh, petroleum first was used for for medicines, and I would say probably not your best quality medicines, but they were used for medicines, and they are still used today. What do you think um, petroleum jelly is? It's petroleum. It's partly petroleum. I think about that when I put it on my lips. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm eating petroleum. <laughs> but it was also used for lubricants. The oil, the first commercial, real commercial use for petroleum was for lubricants, like for, for wagon, um, axles on wagons. Okay, now here's another one. Who knows which state in the U.S. was the first center for the petroleum industry? Wow, you're good. I was thinking people would say Texas, and oh no, you got it, it's Pennsylvania. The center of the petroleum industry in the middle of the 19th century was Western Pennsylvania. And the drilling of the first oil well was in Titusville, Pennsylvania. 
And as any of you who are more familiar with drilling techniques, it was actually a percussion method that they used um, to get to, to the oil. To, it was three feet per day. <laughs> 65 feet they found oil, and my gosh, it was such a gusher, 20 barrels per day, but back then it was big that they said, wow, we gotta drill some more wells. Because remember, we're just talking about lubricants here. We're not talking yet about automotive industry. We got a pretty small market. 20 barrels a day isn't that bad. So it wasn't until the success of the automotive industry in the early 1900s that the success and prominence of the, of the oil industry really was assured. And as an example, in 1899, anyone guess how many autos? 1899, how many autos do you think were in the US? It's in the thousands, 8,000. By 1919, there were 7.6 million autos. So at first, um, in the late 1800s, Wyoming really did not have prominence in the petroleum industry, oil industry. Because at that time, just think about it, if, if you've got a market of lubricants, you don't need a bunch of pumping wells. So there was enough oil found in Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania to supply that need. It wasn't until the number of autos increased that the demand increased, and demand began to outstrip supply. The search was on for more oil supplies in the Rocky Mountain states became a, an exploration area, and so did Wyoming. Now, what, it's not that I'm forgetting about natural gas in this talk. This is actually a natural gas well in Ohio that came in at such pressure that it burned like this for four months. The thing about natural gas and why it wasn't that prominent is you really had to have a wellhead source with natural gas, because it had to be piped. It couldn't be trucked by something we'll see in just a minute, like, like string teams. You had to pipe it. And so if there wasn't a source at the wellhead, it really wasn't practical to use natural gas. Plus, pre-Civil War technology was such that it was, it was it, even though they knew it burned hotter and cleaner, and it was more efficient than, say, coal gas, they couldn't, it was too flammable, it was too much of a hazard to use. Um, so they really did not use it very much until um, Pennsylvania's steel and iron blast furnaces at the wellhead was the first commercial use, really, of natural gas. But a lot of times, um, as we still see today, if there isn't a way to pipe it, it's burned off, it's flared. And that was the case in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So let's go back to Wyoming oil, because things are happening. At the close of the 1880s, a man named Philip Mark, he went by Mark Shannon. He was a Civil War vet. He was a successful Pennsylvania oil wildcatter, a producer, a promoter. Well, he entered the Wyoming scene and he and his associates um, filed claims in and around Salt Creek. Now, how many of you know the Salt Creek area? Salt Creek? We've got some historians here in the audience, and economists, of course, but Salt Creek, located about 45 miles north of Casper. Well, he, um, Shannon and his associates filed claims in the 1880s, in August of 1890, he brought in his first well, a month after Wyoming became the 44th state, for all you historians. Um, and even unrefined, this oil proved to be a very good lubricant. Now remember, we're st still talking about lubricant as the primary use for oil. And in fact, Shannon, um, Philip Shannon, Mark Shannon, founded a refinery in Casper in 1894, and his business was lubricants for the regional railroads. He made 15 grades of lubricants. We're talking the 1890s here. There's no pipeline, 
So what they had to do to get oil from the Salt Creek oil field to Casper, Shannon's solution was by string team. And so when Shannon made his first haul to the Casper refinery in, it was 1895, he made a haul of 45 miles over rough prairie road and freight wagons with um, a string team of, t of 14 horses. It took him five days. And what I have this quote here, it is noticeable now that this oil excites little human interest an interest still less capital. Well, part of that was this transportation problem. It just took, it was so difficult to get this oil to the refinery, and there wasn't a huge market that there was pessimism back in the East Coast. And in fact, Shannon's, um, Philip Shannon's endeavor was a money loser. And in 1904, he sold his business. Okay, this is such an educated audience. I'm gonna ask you, who knows when then the first gusher in Wyoming occurred? Does the name Stock ring a bell to anybody? It's a family named Paul Stock, but his dad, Hugh Stock. 1908 is the first gusher here in Wyoming, October 16th, 1908. Hugh Stock, who was known as Dad stock. Um, that this, this gusher really was a significant for Wyoming. It showed um, the potential, at least in the Salt Creek oil field. And then in 1912, an oil pipeline was constructed from Salt Creek field to Casper. So 1912, a better way to transport that oil. And that's what really got things going for Wyoming oil. Further, what helped, uh, well, helped oil, not known so much agriculture, but in 1919, there was a very hard winter and the agriculture industry uh, just wreaked havoc on the agriculture industry. And people started flocking to these Wyoming oil fields looking for work. And the, 19, the early 1920s were really the heyday for Wyoming oil. We haven't seen anything like that, maybe coal, would be the only comparison. In 1921, there were at least 262 oil wells in the Salt Creek field. The Salt Creek field measured about 10 miles long, five miles wide. There was um, a prediction that there might be as many as 5,616 wells in the Salt Creek field. That never actually happened. About 1,200 wells were actually de um, developed but it was a, a huge deal. And in fact, during the decade of the 1920s, one fifth of all oil produced and refined in the US was extracted here in Wyoming at the Salt Creek field. Well, you know, one, as a historian, an oral historian, whoops, sorry, um, I always look, okay, what's it like for the people? What's it like for people who are, are living in that time and um, what are they experiencing? So that's always my interest. And so I started looking for, I thought, well, okay, we're talking about the early 1920s. Are there any oral histories with people who, have done, who did work in that time period? Well, I found some. The University of Texas at Austin's uh, Briscoe Center did some oral histories in the early 1950s with some of these oil workers. And they have digitized these and put them on their website. And I'm going to play you a clip. Uh, this clip, um, it was a 1952 interview on open reel tape. So it's a little hard to hear. And now it's done with a man in Texas. His name is Fred Jennings. He started in the Texas fields in 1916. And what you're going to hear him talk about is his wage and a ta the town um, that he lived in while he was working as an as a oil field worker. This is in Texas, but you can, but as you listen to it, this could certainly equate to what's happening in the early Wyoming fields as well to, for workers. Well, I started as, as a roughneck. 
uh, December the 27th, 1960. And I worked on the floor, it was a rough net, and then I went for a short while, about three months, and I worked derricks. And I worked derricks continuously up until for the, for the year. And, uh, or we worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, for three dollars. And uh, well, the derrick man, yeah, we got 25 cents more a day than the men on the floor got. Why? Well, he had more responsibility in the derrick than he had on the floor. He had to take care of the pumps and then the responsibility of a derrick man. He was supposed to know more than the men on the floor. And that's why he got that big 25 cents more. <laughs> well, and uh, that's the way we worked from, from six, from, uh, 16 to the about a year uh, and up to 17 while well, I went to run a drilling rig for the same company, the Crown Central Crown. And uh, so uh, I went to run a, a drilling rig nights. And at that time, while we drove, the night driller draw $275 for 12 hours. And the day diggers got 300 but we worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And we worked, uh, well, up until 1919, uh, while we got a, a little raise from 275 per month to 300. Well, uh, and then in 19, well, in the spring of 1919, while I was a day digger, and the day diggers always got $25 more than the night diggers. Because, uh, supposed to know a little bit more than they did. Well, and then we, I ran that rig up until July 1920, and I was made superintendent of the same company at a salary of uh, $500 a month, and that was seven days a week, and worked from can to can. When did you get your vacation? Well, we had no vacations. We didn't know what that was. I ran a drilling rig for 12 months, seven days a week for one year to a day without loss of a day. That's right. No overtime? No overtime. We didn't know what that was. No. <laughs> no. Well, what was Goose Creek like when you first came here? Well, Goose Creek had a little town down on the bay that called Old Town. It was tents and just little overnight box buildings, as few as a grocery store. And a man by the name of Wick Shamrock, I think, had the only dry goods store down there. And the living conditions was very bad, very bad. You'd have to haul water. We paid 30 cents a barrel for the drinking water. And, uh, so we lived there uh, until 1917, and when the when the big boom really got in going, why a uh, big well, the big gusher, Sweet 16, came in, got wild, and and it moved the town up to which is Pelly now, yeah. and uh, but it was known as Middletown, and when they moved it up there, why there was. Uh, a very few buildings there, very few buildings. There was uh, 25 tents to every shack that was there. And uh, it uh, uh, still had to haul water for drinking. And uh, so they had no roads, had oxen, uh, uh, 12 oxen pulling six joints of six inch drill casing. What he was talking about is he was working 12-hour shifts, seven days a week, and he said it was a year and a day before he got a time off. He, they, he was working straight through. Now, those of you who are in the industry, you might say, hey, well, I did the same thing. It is a bit of the nature of, of the industry, but they, they were working their tails off and they were not living in, in the best of conditions. He talks about the tent town. 
that he lived in. And, and this is, um, can you, if you can imagine, if you've been in Texas, I'm actually from Texas, how humid it is and hot and living in a tent um, from May through uh, October, it would be miserable. So they were, it was some really tough conditions in Texas as they were in Wyoming. And I want to show you, now I realize that the, um, this is kind of dark, but at the very top oops, of this, you can see there's men at the top of this derrick working. And this is the early 1920s photo from the Salt Creek field, but it was dangerous work, it was very hard work. And these towns that grew up here in Wyoming, this is Lavoy, Wyoming, um, it's really the epitome of, of an energy boom town across uh, not just Wyoming, but anywhere. This was the place where, where the men went. This is, it was right in the Salt Creek field, this town, the south central part of the field. And men would go there after work. They were young men, they still had energy. So they would go there after work and they'd have some fun. Of course, it was like, you know, Marshall Dillon and Gunsmoke. Well, there was no Marshall Dillon, but it was like there was the old western town, the cafe, the saloon, the gambling hall. It had it all. What I love about uh, this shot is Salt Creek had no bank. On October 20th, 1922, Salt Creek had no bank. The next day, they had two banks. That's the nature of a boom town. They had two banks. They had the Salt Creek State Bank, which was affiliated with the Wyoming National Bank in Casper. And you can't see it very well, but they had the Salt Creek Bank, which was um, associated with the oil industry. So things were moving. Things were moving really fast. Um, but as we know, we are familiar with Wyoming. We know if there's a boom, we're going to have a bust. And, and sure enough, there's a reason I have Texas on here and not Wyoming. Um, in 1928, that's when the boom days of Wyoming oil really began to, to end. Um, the Salt Creek field, there was over a thousand wells and the pressure to bring that oil up out of the ground had really lessened and it was taking pumps to get the oil out of the ground. And so, uh, workers began to leave for more productive fields, like in Texas and in Montana. You can see the the drilling tech or the drilling at that time just so such close proximity to get that oil out of the ground. Um, but in Wyoming, techniques like that really reduce the the pressure, and uh, Wyoming fields like Salt Creek suffered. And then, of course. 1929, you know what that happened, the Great Depression. Um, and so another blow to the Wyoming oil industry. Towns like Midwest, now Midwest is um, an original boom town for the Salt Creek Field. It was called Home Camp. Then it got changed to the name of Midwest. Of course, it's still there. It's the only town really left of that Salt Creek boom. So towns like Midwest were really trying, you know, the 1929, 30s, really trying to, to attract customers. They were advertising. They were, you know, bringing good picture shows to town. They had dances, but people just simply did not have the money anymore. And they had moved on to other more prosperous areas. So these most of the towns, Lavoy, um, a town called Salt Creek, I can't remember all the other names, but they, they died and the ranchers bought the buildings or some of the buildings ended up burning down. The only bright spot really during this time was in 1938, the first interstate oil pipeline was built from Lance Creek near Lusk to Denver. But it really wasn't until World War II when Allied demands for, for oil increased that we really saw things change with the oil industry. So that's a short description of one boom and bust. I'm going to go to, on to another one that people here in Gillette remember. <laughs> 
There you go, there's your former mayor. <laughs> okay, how many of you were here during that time when they had their big boom? Um, Mike Enzi, as you probably know in Gillette, was mayor from 1974 to 1982. Of course, our, uh, our US, one of our US senators, Gillette, was one of many towns during the 1970s that experienced an energy boom, not just from oil and gas, but from a con confluence of different energy sources. And I have this picture of Evanston to show. It was um, Gillette experienced this, Green River, where my father-in-law was the mayor during the boom times, Dick Wagner. Um, uh, Evanston, yeah, Evanston, Rock, River, Rock Springs, Green River, Big Piney had a, had a boom at this time. But regarding uh, Gillette, now as we know, this community, as you know, has a very long history with coal, but of course oil and natural gas are major parts of the Campbell, uh, County, Campbell County economy. And by now, natural gas began to be a player. Um, pipeline construction uh, occurred, a real surge in pipeline construction for natural gas in the 50s and 60s. So energy booms in the 70s trans transformed Gillette into the energy capital of the nation. And as an example, between 1960 and 1980, Campbell County's population increased from about 6,000 to 24,000. And in the early 1980s, the average age in Gillette was 28 years old. You guys were young. You still are, but you were really young back then. So growth was coming so rapidly to Gillette in the 70s that the town started pouring forth subdivisions and trailer courts. In fact, weren't you telling me last night it was only in the year 2000 that frame-built homes outnumbered trailer, trailers here in Gillette. So there was, there was an outpouring of that and it was difficult um, for officials to keep track of, of zoning regulations at that time. And Gillette was not getting a very good reputation. And then, of course, as you may know, there was a UW sociologist who coined the term Gillette syndrome. Um, and then the news media picked up on that, and, and Gillette was branded with this, this name. Well, here's someone else you may know of, Steve Gardner. Um, he was a school teacher here in Gillette. Well, he, this is in the early 80s, well, he had heard this term, Gillette syndrome. He was wondering, okay, what do people in Gillette, how do they feel about what's happening in their community? And so he conducted at least 29 oral history interviews with people here in Gillette. He and his wife then transcribed all of them, and they put them in this book, this self-published book called Anyone know? Rumblings from Razor City. And you can actually find this book. I think the Rockpile Museum has it. I'm sure your county library has it. It is just wonderful. Mike Enzi has it. He did an interview with Mike Enzi. Mike Enzi tells this great story, and I don't want to overdo my time, but he's the mayor. He's in this small office. He's at his desk, and he's talking to these really important oil industry people. Well, his office is on the way to the ladies' room. And so whenever he'd have these meetings with these bigwigs, they'd be sitting there, and a woman would travel through, and the toilet would flush, and then she would leave. And this is all during his important meetings with these oil people. And so he laughs. He laughed about it. He, actually, he seems like he had a great time. But he was you know, mayor during a very big boom time. Now, the, I contacted Steve Gardner. And I asked him if he still had copies of his interviews. And he did. He didn't have all of them. He didn't have Mike Enzi's. He had quite a few. So he sent the American Heritage Center those original cassette tapes. And so I asked our audiovisual person to make me some clips. Kevin Dahl. Now, does anyone know Kevin? OK, excellent. Kevin Dahl. 1981, he was the 29-year-old editor of the Gillette News Record. He'd only been in town for about four years. Now, when 
he talked about the boom, he talked about it in terms of, wow, what great energy we have in Gillette. Um, we were able to double our new staff. Well, I guess I meant that in the sense that um, things are growing here. You're adding, you're adding uh, uh, people, for instance, all the time. Uh, I guess the, the minds uh, are the first thing that come to my uh, train of thought here. But uh, in addition to that, even the newspaper here, I could take the newspaper, for example, when, when I came here uh, four years ago, the staff was half the size it is now. So uh, obviously, new positions were created. And, uh, and, and as an example of, of opportunity, um, four years ago, the paper had a managing editor. Now it has a managing editor and an assistant managing editor. So as an example of opportunity, uh, there's another management position there that didn't exist before, in addition to the other positions for reporters and stuff. And who is going to who is who is going to get these jobs? Is it going to be the established people? Well, in most cases, they have their families and they're settled somewhere. But the younger people who are out and about looking for opportunities and stuff, they uh, come to a place like Gillette. They're not quite as they can't afford to be quite as uh, picky, I suppose. And Gillette doesn't have a, a big image. So, so to make a long story short, the young people happen to be in the right place at the right time, and they get the opportunities. Uh, okay. And plus, they're they're. They're leaving other areas of the country. Uh, I, have, I know people in Indi Indiana, for instance, and, and you know, even back there, you know, almost regardless of what you do, a place like Gillette is, is considered a place to go because there's jobs. There are jobs, and the young people are the ones that are the, the ones least likely to get a job where they are, so they're the first ones to make the move. Another person he talked to was Sergeant Mike da McDaniel. Anyone know Mike? How do you see the uh, the people? Just in, in general terms, or, or in specific, how you'd like. Uh, how do you see the people reacting to what's going on? The boom. And, uh, well, I don't think there's any conscious reaction to it. Uh, we see it more in in subconscious ways and in kind of mindless, unthinking acts. Um, I don't think that a person comes to Gillette and consciously thinks, "This is a boom town. I shall now change my mode of operation and react to this situation in this fashion." <coughs> it's more of a subconscious reaction to the stress involved in living in the community, and it it, it manifests itself very often in alcohol and those kind of problems. Uh, you'll find people coming here, and for one reason or another, when they get off work, their relaxation is going down to the bars and such. Uh, drugs and such are readily available here, so you find a lot of people getting their recreation through chemical means. And this, of course, <laughs> inevitably leads to a lot of the personal problems. Now, we're lucky in Gillette in that we don't have the severe burglary, mugging, and other crime rates that are normally related to high drug use, such as they have in the big cities. We don't have people here in this town who have to burglarize places to support a drug habit, because in this community, it's one of the few places in the world where you can work stoned out of your mind on an oil rig. Uh, making 20 bucks an hour. And when you're making that kind of money as a single person, maybe living in a crash pad with five other people, you know, putting it on rent here and there, your funds are pretty much unlimited to use wherever you want. And thus people can afford pretty heavy duty drug habits without having to resort to the traditional crime methods of supporting them. In the big cities where uh, you have the unemployment problems that you do and where jobs pay very little and you can find them, then that's where you really run into those crime problems. And so he wasn't seeing a crime problem, but he was seeing a substance abuse problem. Um, Walt Gasson, a wildlife biologist, he, he expresses an even more dour view. He says, I, prefer, I would prefer Wyoming circa 1965 than 1982. Uh, aside maybe from what you've seen as, a, as a, an employee of the uh, Game and Fish Department, uh, did the, has a boom had effects on you personally? <laughs> yeah, it has. Uh, I have, I'm a lifelong resident of the state. I was mm -hmm. born and raised here. And like a fair number of lifelong residents of Wyoming, uh, I think that I would prefer Wyoming circa 1965 Wyoming circa 1982. And unfortunately, that in reality. We have to live with what, we, what we've got and what we intend to make of this place. And I think it's it's made me it's made me a little more active, I suppose. It's made me mad. It's made me uh, 
have a, I don't know, what should I say? I look at industry and government in a, very, in a more skeptical light, I think. I see a lot of people that are coming into this state that don't have the love for this state that I do. I see a lot of people coming here for exactly one thing, and that's what it can do for them, how much money it can, it can put in their pockets. And I don't fault them for that. That's, that's human nature. And certainly, I've well, got to make a living. But I see damn few people in this state that love it as I do, and who, who I feel will ha have any commitment to it after, after this economic tooth that we're on wears off. So he's regretting, actually, um, the turn that's being taken in Wyoming's economy. So I, I play these three because I want to show you there was myriad views. There's myriad viewpoints when it comes to something like this in, in a community. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a, a few minutes with another project that I did. Well, this particular boom, and um, when do you recall it ending? Do you remember? When you remember when things started to really Go in a downturn, 70s, 82. What's that? <laughs> Sounds like things maybe were happening here a little early. 83, things really started happening badly here in Wyoming. And in fact, the Wyoming legislature passed a, a budget based on rising energy costs, and then the bottom dropped out. And from what I understand, the 1970s energy crisis and then a renewed flow of energy resources from other countries uh, contributed to the downturn. And then making matters worse for Wyoming was an energy bust that coincided with an agricultural debt crisis. So we really had a double whammy. And at, oh, so over the next 15 years, Wyoming wages stagnated, unemployment skyrocketed, and the legislature had little cash for basic road and maintenance, um, building maintenance. Uh, oil prices uh, remained low. January 1999, there was $17 a barrel, in contrast to $35 a barrel in 19, or 1981. And you may remember, I think this is actually a Canadian bumper sticker, so they have the same problem we do, but. But you may remember this, you may remember that some Wyoming cars started, started sporting these bumper stickers. Oh God, please give us another oil boom. We promise not to piss it away this time. Well, I know um, coal bed methane was one of the next booms to hit this area in the early 2000s. I don't go into depth with it today I would like to do oral history on it, but I don't have a lot of information on that particular boom. It's certainly one that needs, deserves to have attention paid to it by um, historians, and I would like to do some oral history on it. But what I will do is I'm going to finish my presentation with a couple of oral history projects that I have done, along with Ali's help on one of them. So the two projects, the first one um, the American Heritage Center did began in fall of 2000. And what we did, we started looking at our geology collections that we have at the American Heritage Center. And we realized we have a lot on the business of mining, the exploration, the development of the resource. But what we didn't have was how that affected the nearby communities. And so we thought about, okay, what's an area of Wyoming that 
recently experienced a boom and we could talk to them about that experience. And we immediately thought of Sublette County, Jonah Field, Pinedale Anticline. So in 2010, we established a, a project with help from the Wyoming Humanities Council, thank you, and uh, interviewed more than 40 people involved in and, and impacted by, when I say impacted by, I don't mean that all in a bad way, impacted by in good and bad ways as people perceived it. Just a little background before I show you a very short video. Um, it was known historically that there was a wealth of natural gas in subsurface Sublette County, but it was not deemed economically feasible to get to it. And it wasn't really until um, advances in hydraulic fracturing technology in the early 90s that it became possible to, to extract it. And probably as this audience knows, hydraulic fracturing is a combination of water, sand, maybe ceramic beads and chemicals to fracture the rock to allow the gas to flow more easily to um, the wellhead. This is a Jonah Field in 2005, but in um, around 1998, um, the Jonah Field started coming online, and there started to be in Pinedale especially hints that um, something was coming their way, but it really wasn't until the Pinedale anticline, and remember this is BLM land, mostly BLM land, some forest service, so we're talking federal land. So the BLM and the industry are really negotiating this. Um, it wasn't until the Pinedale Anticline came on, came on in 2000 that truly a boom began in Pinedale. Now one thing, um, there were some complex fracturing techniques and some really deep wells that required a larger workforce over a longer period of time. And so that was just the recipe for a boom in Pinedale. Pinedale Anticline located a lot closer to Pinedale than the Jonah Field. And sure enough, by the early 2000s, Sublette County began to experience what Gillette became familiar with. Um, infrastructure strains, increased pressure on medical services, all the things that if you have lived through a boom, you will know about. Things that the Bakken is experiencing now in um, North Dakota or South Dakota. But um, what I'm going to play for you is a video that was done by a student in, at Stanford, a graduate student at Stanford who became interested in our project. And she took some of the clips from our Sublet County project, uh, um, audio clips, and she created a collage out of them. She calls this collage the boom. So I'm going to play this collage for you, and this will give you just a sample of some of the viewpoints that we got from our oil histories. You don't drill for oil and natural gas and not bring a huge amount of change with you. Um, some of it's great, good jobs, good paying jobs, good taxes, good return to the community. You've got the largest natural gas find arguably in North America. And so there's a tremendous rush. It was like the gold rush. It was a much bigger development. It was a much faster boom. It was a much faster ramp up. Everybody was asking the same question, is how much is it going to be? How many people are coming in? And no one had the answer to that. And then once the boom came, everything changed. When they started in the Jonah to do the deep fracking, it, I mean, the writing was on the wall that this was not going away. Suddenly we have thousands of wells before people are really aware. The only thing that everybody was worried about was just to get the gas out of the ground. There was probably a huge amount of naivete in this community that, that, that change was coming, but no one really wanted to think that that was going to happen. 
You know, they couldn't get enough people to work for these companies. I mean, they're just the outpouring of people that came in from everywhere across the country. Pinedale could not keep pace. <clears throat> and you, um, you would go to the grocery store, and the grocery store shelves would be empty. And that is one of the biggest frustrations of this whole boom, is that it was just so overwhelming. So overwhelming. It's a, how do you stop a train? This is my third boom. You get a lot smarter and a lot uh, more solid as you go through these things because it's very easy to get lightheaded when you're going through your first one because you just think the money is never going to quit. You know, suddenly the county becomes very, very wealthy, almost overnight. It's like Jed Clamp in the shotgun. The money is huge. I mean, we've been able to do things for people in our community that, that are unheard of in other parts of this state. When you do have this huge windfall of money, it is an awesome opportunity to build up your infrastructure. And you do need to take advantage of that. Our streets now are getting paved, and we're getting sidewalks in Pinedale, Wyoming. When you bring in too many people too fast and you, you lose that sense of who's in front of you out there, you know, you, you go into a store or you go down a street, and pretty quick you don't know anybody, so you don't pay any attention and you, don't, you quit waving and you quit smiling. The kith and kin that was here before, you know, grandma was down the street, everybody knew everybody. I mean, if my kids went to what was Failer's grocery store back then and messed up, I mean, the clerk knew me and she'd call me. You know, I mean, it was, it was that kind of a community. That was gone. We were so spoiled with, you know, the grocery stores where I would socialize, catch up with people, and now all of a sudden I don't even recognize people. The people at my checkout stand, I don't know who they are. They're changing all the time. You know, my parents are, in their, like I said, in their 80s. And they just are very sad that they don't go, I mean, when they go to the grocery store anymore, they don't know anybody in the grocery store. That huge transformation was just real hard for people in this community to grasp because it was an idyllic community. Hey, George, when I retire, let's buy a little place in Pinedale, live on the upper green. Okay. And that has, I think the amount of large-scale development has turned some of those people off because it's not as, well, it's not as quaint as it used to be. Yeah, it's changed it in a way that I think is really irreversible at this point. And now it's just so infiltrated into, like, being the core of this community that it's taken away from what was the core of this community, which was ranching, hunting. You know, that's what this town, a little bit of tourism, like, on their way to Yellowstone, like, that's what this area was. You know, really what drives this area is obviously big industry. That innocence is now gone for, and that innocence is an innocence of that rural spirit. It, it's not the small town that I moved to. Pinedale's not a cow town anymore. Some people have said that that video is very pessimistic, kind of depressing, <laughs> um, and that could be, I don't know how you felt about it. That's one person's view. I will say um, the oral histories, all the ones we did, we did more than 40. They're all available at the American Heritage Center. They all have transcripts, and they're available to the public. If there's some um, uh, research that you might need with something of that nature, um, I'll go ahead and, and stop now because I want to take questions from you. Are we one of the, it's July, one of the few places? Because as the oil boom ends in the early 80s, we have a coal boom which is still sustaining. So the question is Gillette had, an, had a coal boom that in the 80s that's still sustaining Gillette. Is that uh, an, an isolated case? I'd say the only other place I can think of is probably Rock Springs that has economy that has sustained itself. Now, I don't know, I don't think it sustained itself as much as Gillette. Gillette is remarkable. Well, Rock Springs had a coal boom and an oil boom and a coal boom. Coal boom. Yeah. 
Yeah, Rock Springs did, but Gillette, and I would say Gillette has really capitalized on, on their um, dollars more than I would most other communities have. I'm, I'd be proud <laughs> of being in Gillette of what you've been able to do with your dollars. That's a, I'm, that's a really good point. Um, she was talking about how I would say some of the administration from the coal industry came here to Gillette and stayed for a few years but were drivers of community growth. And, and I think that is such a good point because they're bringing their families here and they want good for their families and for this community they live in. They don't want their kids going to bad schools. They, they, they want, um, and they want to, I was talking to a woman from Ultra Petroleum in Pinedale, and she said they expect us to get involved. It's like you, get, you come here and, okay, what, what, what are you going to join? Rotary, um, what board are you going to be on? They expect them to do that. Anyone else? I saw, I saw a video that you did on the Niobrara. Niobrara oil play is now a big lull, <laughs> as you know. This was an oil play that was supposed to happen in the Niobrara Formation. It is happening in northern Colorado. The Niobrara Formation is southern Wyoming. It's into Kansas, Nebraska, northern Colorado. Things are happening in northern Colorado. Things aren't happening so much in Wyoming. But it looked like things were going to happen. It looked like leasing was going on big, big guns in like 2009, 2010. They thought a boom was coming their way in Torrington, Wheatland, um, Pine Bluffs. And so we talked to people, over more than 40 people in those areas, and it was really interesting to, to hear the reactions. Laramie County, we don't want this, primarily speaking, except for Pine Bluffs. Torrington, a little bit guarded. Wheatland, bring it on. We will take whatever. We are tired of being this poor community. Um, that was so interesting to hear uh, those different viewpoints. And I'm generalizing, I realize, but that was a very much how I would characterize in a totality. It depends on where you live. It depends on what you do.